brothers and my sisters Only they can understand everybody, this is Joe. TVO Campfire is aimed at those vets who were successful in their lives, maybe not in their own opinions, but in ours. And that's what we're bringing to you, our vets who are truly successful and how you can learn from them. Hey, good morning, everybody. On this episode of TVO Campfire, I want to introduce Jeffrey Gray. He's from Rowlett, Texas. He's lived there since about 99 time frame. Uh, member of the U.S. Marine Corps from 78 through 89. And while he was in the Marine Corps, he did a little bit of security duty time, uh, U.S. Embassy, Austria, Bulgaria. Uh, then he did a little bit of recruiting out in Missouri. And uh, in between there, he had quite a bit of fun, which we'll get into today. Uh, but now on the civilian side of the house, He's volunteered uh, in Collin County as a detention officer. He's worked with TSA. He's done some private security and how I ran into him uh, in his new profession uh, is, is an actor. He was on um, set with I've Got Your Six that I had the privilege to be a part of on there. And in between takes, I really had time to sit down with him and never had I heard of Jeffrey Gray. More and more time that we started talking um, and kind of bouncing it off of each other, Rebecca was like, that's the guy that walks the bridge. And I'm like, wait a second, that, that's the dude on the bridge? <laughs> and I've seen him across social media. I've, I've seen the positive stuff that he's done in his community. Just never knew that it was Jeffrey Gray sitting here talking with me. So that's what brings him on today uh, to be one of our veterans that we highlight who's been successful in their life. And in my opinion, and in my eyes, he's successful because of what he's done outside of the military, what he's done post-military career. Um, he has made a major impact on his community and what, he, what he's done with his walk. He's very notable for walking what's now referred to as the Heroes Memorial Bridge. Uh, it's two miles across and two miles back, and he walks this thing every day carrying an American flag and raising awareness for um, suicide prevention for not only our military veterans, but our first responders as well. And you can see usually on the 22nd day of each month, um, they'll actually do a, an organized walk and he will have dozens, if not hundreds of people following him. Uh, he sets out 22 flags across that bridge there that runs between Rowlett and Rockwall on State Highway 66. And he's doing the, the flags on the Memorial Day, 4th of July, 9-11, Veterans Day. And I highly recommend you guys go out and make that four mile walk with him on those particular days. So without further ado, here's Jeffrey Gray. Uh, good morning. Welcome, good. we're excited to have you. Well, thank you, it's an honor. So are you from Texas, Jeff? Is that your yes. hometown area there? Yes, ma'am, born and raised in Dallas. I'm a okay. true tech. So did you have influence from somebody in the family to go into the military or what was your childhood like that led up um, to your decision to go in and enlist? Well, basically my family was in uh, uh, either construction, plumbing or something like that. And uh, after I played football, I wasn't you know, good enough to go to college and they really never thought of college. Um, my uncle was the only one that I, uh, that was in the Navy in the World War II, and he had a lot of influence on my life. Uh, but it was mainly, I just, I don't know, I just felt that I needed to do something else besides that. I wanted to get, I just wanted to do something uh, for uh, better than me. And that's the, just the way I felt at that time. It's kind of, you know, when you did, it's kind of, and both of you, you know, when you had to make a decision, and I never forget, I went to the recruiting office in Greenville, Texas, 
and I hadn't made my decision on what branch. And uh, I walked into the uh, Navy uh, and listened to him and I listened to, the, well, to be honest with the Air Force guy wasn't there, but uh, that's just the way it was. He was very busy. You know how they are. They get a lot of people, probably more than we do. And uh, the Army, I listened to them and then all of a sudden I walked by and the Marine recruiter was standing and he goes, it's, it's about time. And, and so I went in there and uh, he said the key word, what can you do for me? And that impressed me. And I knew it was harder. Uh, I don't know if the time Boys and Company C was one of the movies out there. If you ever watched that, you would probably say, I ain't joining the Marine Corps. Well, that's why I did. I just wanted to make it do something other than, uh, and I wanted to kind of get out of Texas. I wanted to travel. And boy, did I. That's pretty exciting um, to think about how that all worked out. And um, so you're still doing a lot, though, for the local high school there, too, and sharing other veteran stories on Friday nights at the football games. You're still very involved. Yeah, I, was, uh, I consider it's my hometown. I have actually live in Rowlett, but these two communities are so close together. Um, Rockwall has been my, uh, I moved there in 71 when it was really small. Um, I, my coach I was a very influenced, uh, very, uh, influenced me a lot, uh, followed me a lot while I was in the service. Um, but football uh, had a lot to help me a lot in the Marine Corps by what, the, what they teach you. And uh, that brought along with that. And so I thought I'd give back to my community in many ways. Football, I love football and I report football on the sideline and they support me enough to allow me to be, do that. Uh, and uh, they, they go with our uh, morals, uh, honor, courage and commitment. I actually give a coin out to people that fit those traits and uh, you know, challenge coin. And, uh, and actually one of the coaches that's, uh, is that Geyer now uh, has one of my flags. And I sometimes give those away to people that has influenced me and influenced their uh, community. Uh, and uh, it's one of the smallest things I think I could do to make somebody uh, realize what they, could, what they do for their community. Yeah. So Jeff, when, when you were growing up, did, were you raised both of your parents, the grandparents involved uh, as well? You know, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, my, my dad passed away. Well, first, my dad was divorced from my mom and, uh, at the time, and he passed away when he was 39 years old. And uh, I was lucky enough, yes, my grandparents had a lot of influence in, in my life, um, but they didn't raise me. I was raised by many uh, stepfathers. And uh, one of them was named Bill Pringle, uh, had a lot of influence on me and he uh, helped me with a lot of things. Cause you do personally, I think you need a man in, in your, whether I don't care if it's your stepfather or something, you need somebody that you can go ask. Mothers, my mother supported me more than you can ever imagine, but she was not a man, of course. <laughs> and, uh, but I was, I was lucky I also had uncles and grandparents and uh, they're no longer with me, but I learned so much from them. And I, even while I was in the Marine Corps, and because there was one time that I wanted out and uh, mm -hmm. it was rough times and I stuck with it. And uh, it, the reason I asked that is because across the going on the four years now that We've been doing Texas Veterans Outdoors, and as we're sitting around the campfire, per se, or even like on a restaurant night out and just talking with people, it is amazing how many veterans had like grandparents in their lives and hearing the stories and the involvement of the grandparents and, and you know, both parents in their lives that kind of led them to who they are today. Um, is there any significant events that really stands out in your mind on stuff that you still have with you today that's based off your morals that you learned from your early, early childhood from those people? 
Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's a good one there too. Uh, I would say being a gentleman it would be one of the, uh, the key things, how to be a, a good person uh, and think before you do. It's probably a big thing that I learned. Uh, my grandfather was very, uh, he was a plumber and I used to help him. And uh, it's just some of the things they, they would say or do to be a man, uh, man up, uh, suck it up. I heard that before I even joined the Marine Corps. <laughs> Um, so that's, I think that has a lot of, you know, outside of your parents, your parents were control a lot of your life, but your grandparents were more open to a lot of things to teach you. They taught me how to fish and stuff like that to where your parents are working. Your grandparents may not as much, but they had, I think that's the biggest deal is getting another, uh, opinion. But throughout my life, I was lucky enough to have, I just don't think you see it as much because of both parents working that you got to have somebody to give you direction. Uh, and you're going to make mistakes. Everybody does because you're going to learn off of them. Uh, it's what you do after you make the mistake is, is the big thing. Um, and I had, I was very lucky that I had very uh, supportive grandparents and uh, my uncles uh, and my aunts, of course. But I have a, a variety of great people that helped me along my way. As, now, as you were as you were coming up with those people, did they promote sports? Did they promote like agriculture, outdoors stuff? Um, what was it that really, you know, or if they did push you, uh, push you towards or try to, to guide you towards? Yeah, I mean, I learned a lot about uh, farming uh, where they have horses in my family with a lot of them. My uncle was a country and Western singer. Um, I learned about probably a lot that a lot of, you know how to deal with uh, I guess you would call celebrities. I didn't even think I think I told Rebecca about that, but um, you know there were some celebrities all around our house or his house, and I just thought of some as people. Uh, I didn't I thought everybody did that, and uh, they always taught us to keep how to keep your uh, uh, I guess honor, but how to keep your your self control. Uh, control certain situations and uh, you know for most of my I probably taught more now than I ever do because I was very shy and the Marine Corps opened me up a lot of ways uh, but it taught me so much that I still use to this day and Rebecca can account both of you can account to what you learn for you still you still put it in your everyday um, like they say I saw this one thing with this Navy I, I think it was an admiral he says, you start your day off by a simple task, complete uh, that simple task and you'll complete your day better, like making your bed. Is that, do y'all agree with that? <laughs> I still so make mine. We, I don't use the corners at 45 anymore, but. <laughs> <laughs> but those are really good principles too, though. When you think about messages that you learn from leadership and some of the things that you hear people still say is the very, is, especially if they're prior military, the first thing that you can do um, to make your day productive is get out of bed and make the bed. That, that is the very first thing you could do. But let me ask you, did you have family or friends that were in the military when you were growing up that were really influential in your decision to enlist? You know, I can... I I did talk to my, my uncle uh, and he was all for it. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's that thing, my stepfather really didn't talk to my mom was not for it that much. Um, but, uh, my coach, my coaches were basically my, uh, fathers in a way, you know, the father influences a lot in my life. Uh, there was, there were some times where I almost quit football and, uh, you know, I have I, I can't get into what happened in my life. I don't really want to bring that up, but there were some issues when I was growing up. Nothing serious, but uh, more mental than anything else. Uh, and uh, but the coaches really I relied on them, and they got me straight. And uh, that had a lot to do with me going in the military. So, with that said, Jeff, on I definitely I don't want to I don't want to deep dive into it. Uh, and respect your your privacy on it. 
Can you kind of tell us about a little bit of the adversity though, like how you got over that? Really, what was it with some of those, those key factors that said, hey, you know, I'm dealing with situation X here. And, you know, did you rely on other people to help you out? Was it something you just kind of figured out on your own? Um, can, can you kind of go into a little bit of detail on that with us? Well, the biggest thing is what it was I had to admit to something was uh, it wasn't my fault. And uh, I had to let them know what was going on because they knew something was not right. And I let them know. And I got great guidance by just uh, them helping me. I mean, being, uh, I would say aggressive, but, you know, back then, you know, you, it, that's where I heard this word, suck it up. Come on, bud, you're a man. Uh, you got to be a man about this. And what can we do for you? We're here for you uh, to help you in any way. And talking was probably, and I still say this today, listening, they listened and to me and said the right words. I think that's really important what you're sharing. And for those who are watching or listening that have someone in their younger years, one of the, the things that we need to kind of remember is that that is crucial into helping someone make the right choices in any direction that they're, they're going. Um, but listening and providing guidance. I, I know for me, the suck it up has been something that I've kind of done most of my life anyway. But I think there are times that exactly with what you're saying make a huge difference. And so- Can I say these words? Remember these words? It's not in the bad words, but embrace the suck. I haven't heard that one for a long time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Military uh, what we're talking about. So um, but I want I want I want to definitely bring something up though. And this is you know, we can talk about it now and laugh about it uh amongst ourselves now that you know we're we're old and separated, right? <laughs> yeah, from the military. But you really you go back and you look at some of these young kids who are in there now carrying the torch or carrying the flag per se, or standing the watch for those yeah. of us that have departed now. And there's a, there's a film out there on uh, uh, Amazon prime. It's called who, who killed Lieutenant Van Dorn. And that film actually talks about a good decade of culture of my life while I served in, in the Navy. And that culture is something that's, that's kind of put out there um, amongst those young kids. And if you do not come into the military having some, some confidence and already having uh, kind of your, your wits about you and knowing to stand up and knowing where to call foul on a, on quite a few things um you can get lost in that embrace the suck or suck it up buttercup you know mentality and next thing you know you're in a culture of of hey you know suck it up this is part of it when really that's not it that's not a good thing for people's lives and that's really not a good thing for um your development and your leadership. Uh, and that can really, really kill you uh, in a professional corporate world on your post-military career. And mm -hmm. so that's why I say now you and I, uh, you know, and everybody out there who are in their post-military careers now can sit back and laugh and yeah, suck it up buttercup, you know, embrace the suck, et cetera. Uh, but some of those kids that are out there that are, that are having to suck it up, really need to pay attention and really need to open their eyes up and realize, hey, uh, you don't need to be sucking up and you don't need to be embracing the suck on a culture that's bad. And yeah. when y'all actually watch that movie, that film that, you know, who killed uh, Lieutenant Van Dorn, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Um, they've got some young mechanics in there that we're working, that we're talking about how the culture of working on uh, MH-53s and as well as CH-53s on the Marine Corps side of the house, 
uh, the culture was, hey, just do what it takes to get the bird in the air. And which eventually um, led to quite a few deaths. Um, so just just something that, you know, we we want to to bring out. Uh, I know I was in that culture for like I'm saying I'm there a decade, right? Um, but I, I can say this where the movie contradicts my the culture I was in. Anytime that I said something, anytime that I brought some attention out on something that was negative or something that wasn't right and revolving maintenance on those helicopters, I was listened to. But I can see where those young kids don't have the confidence, you know or can stand on their own two feet and call foul, you know, in today's society. So I definitely think, you know, thanks for bringing that up. I, I've seen you mention, or, you know, listen to you mention it multiple times now on embrace the suck or suck it up, buttercup. Um, oh, I can go that, you know, every, like I went in the seventies and eighties and uh, to the nineties, but, you know, even before me, you can go back to when the Marine Corps, Marine, Marine Corps has been around a long time before the country. And every decade or whatever you want to call it has a different culture, a different mindset. There's a key word, mindset. Uh, that's where I wanted to talk about uh, sucking it up. You got to have a good mindset. And you're always, maybe you have a different one throughout the, you know, like you said, a culture, everything changes. The time frames of Vietnam, uh, World War II, World War One, and then you know you're going to have a different way of training with the weapons that you get. Uh, you know the Marine Corps is basically you know we're very big on, and so is the Navy because we're part of the Navy. People some some forget about that, but we have a set of rules, uh, and morals to go by, and uh, that's where it comes into where you say where you got to zip it up, you know, shut up. But it's opened up more because of what's going on around you. Uh, the, like when I was in boot camp, we were spit on, hit, whatever. They don't, don't do that today. They don't even cuss at you today. The cameras are everywhere. Uh, there's some that, you know, there, it's, it's just a different way of training. And uh, so they got a different mindset than we did. Okay. And you, we all have to work together. And your mindset's going to be different from mine. It's how you were raised. That you said that. It's how I think you were raised. You got to give the drill instructor something to work with, especially now, because back then they would almost beat it into you, or they can't do that anymore. So let's uh, talk about that for a minute, though. Um, yeah. You know, the culture in the military has changed from like when you were in, when I was in, when Joe was in. Our moral compass, though, is so important because if we know something isn't right, we knew we do need to stand up for that. You were in when they had a lot of hazing going on, and I was in during the transition of that. When I was in boot camp, they started phasing that out, saying there is no longer these things that are allowed in. And you would still kind of see some things, but it started it started kind of getting tucked away. But let's talk about where you were stationed at. Are you a East Coast Marine or are you a West Coast Marine? I'm a Hollywood Marine. And proud You're a Hollywood of it. Marine. Okay, so you guys <laughs> proud of it, it, baby, <laughs> for a while. <laughs> yeah, and um, you know, it's it's like you know, you go to Paris Island, you're going to deal with sand fleas. You're going to go to uh, the West Coast. You're going to deal with uh, the mountains, you know, and uh, uh, the heat. Uh, so you, you know, but you're all still going through rough times. You know, you're all living in a squad bay and together. Uh, following rules and I mean uh, I laugh when I tell my wife the joke I wore I was stupid I had long I should have cut my hair had it down here and I wore cowboy boots to boot camp mm -mm, not a good time and I went in with two other guys from my hometown we were called the Rockwall boys and the, you know it's just uh, like I said the culture is different and when I got out we had to deal with uh Vietnam okay and even though I don't even think it happened it did probably happen you know we, I was spit at called a baby killer and it had nothing to do with me okay but it was a different thing I, when you had hair cut short 
back in the 70s, what did everybody else have? Yeah. Now it's flipped. <laughs> you see, I'm with long hair, and you got everybody has short hair. So it was, they, we stood out, and they didn't like us. They didn't like us at La June. They didn't like us at, uh, at Quantico. They, they didn't, well, not Quantico as much, but they, I mean, uh, uh, Pendleton or uh, San Diego, uh, Oceanside. You bet, were you ever over Oceanside? Oceanside's were Pendleton. I lived in Oceanside, but I wasn't stationed there. At one point, I was in the reserves in Pasadena, California. Right. Um, but how many duty stations did you end up having, or did you stay the whole, you obviously didn't stay the whole time at Camp Pendleton. No, well, first, when I graduated boot camp, my, my MOS was 0811 artillery, field artillery. Um, oh, probably go, I think it was in there. First, I enlisted in the uh, combat, uh, it was a combat enlistment bonus. Uh, it was, you know, my, my scores, I took this, and I told this when I was a recruiter, when you take that ASVAB test, or if you know somebody's going to take it, really take it, okay? I was one, I took it out of class. I wasn't thinking I was going in the military. And so that can follow you, and I didn't get to retake it. So I had to, I just didn't have, <laughs> I'm not saying it's bad to be an infantryman or artillery, but I didn't have the scores to do what I wanted to do. And now I think they actually will re re let you retest because uh, I did later on and I scored much higher. But uh, the money was there for a bonus. And it fit okay. I didn't really know what I wanted to do in effect, but so I went, but it was it worked out for me pretty good. But I had to go to 29 Palms, California. Uh, and I was there, I don't know if you've ever been there. And, and when I was there, we still had the open squad bays and they were just getting the rooms. So it was difficult. There was nothing to do there. Or Pendleton, where you can go everywhere. You got an ocean, you know, you can go places. Not there. The only place you could go to was Palm Springs and uh, that's it. It was just pure hell, really, there for any of the young kids. It's better now, but we trained and trained and trained there uh, in the desert. And before we even know the. Uh, all these wars come in, but uh, I wanted to get out of there, and I went. Uh, I was approached, or because I, I tried to do what I could do to make myself a good Marine. I would actually, uh, I guess you could saw me. They think I was kissing somebody's butt, but I looked at it as a way to prove myself. I wanted, and I had people helping me. I wore my my camo back camis back then, starched impressed i did what i did i tried to be the best marine i possibly could i ran the best pft i trained all the time while i was drinking i was running doing everything i could do to get to become an embassy guard and i think i talked to rebecca back then you had to be the top 10 percent of the marine corps and you had to prove it uh and i had an officer he was actually uh in an enlistment listed and then he became an officer and he helped me out a lot talking about influences. I was looking for people to influence me and I found them. They're out there. Uh, and they're looking you over too, whether you need help or not. And uh, it got me on embassy duty. And it was the hardest thing I think I've ever had to prove uh, to become something was, was that. I think that's a good point though, that oftentimes we look for a good role model, someone that's going to influence us and lead us in a direction that um, we want to go. I think that there are a lot of times that we don't see that someone is influencing us in a certain way until we, you know, they say hindsight is twenty twenty, And I know for me, I had a drill instructor I thought was just so hard on me. And then I ended up getting injured at one point and that person ensured that I got the right care. When I look back on the, and we're talking a lot of years, when I look back on what that drill instructor did for me during that time was I realized so many different things that I didn't see then. And I think oftentimes that we're looking for things and we don't understand things at certain points, but you just made some really profound comments that I hope people will take to heart, not only from way back then, but 
where we're at now because we're always growing and always learning and um, developing. It's when we just stop and kind of close ourselves off that that doesn't happen. So how was embassy duty for you once you made it there? Because like you said, I mean, back then the cut, there was a whole lot to get a, to get promoted, the cutting scores were high and there was only so many spots available and anything that you wanted to do, you really had to outperform and really shine because it was kind of brutal in a way they I mean, the cutting the score it sounds so cutthroat but it was I mean you only had so many slots when those promotions came up or when certain positions that you might want might come available you had to really make sure that you were you were above yeah well, I think I to- told you about the process was very difficult it took uh, about three months and I had uh, back then they had pros and cons uh, uh, that's how we did. I don't know if the Navy did the same thing. It's your performance on how you were, uh, not only physically, but mentally, how you treated people, uh, how you were as a, a Marine, uh, for whatever position. I actually was a Lance Corporal and the, back then, you know, there weren't a lot of sergeants. Uh, uh, I was a, a section chief of a howitzer and, uh, Basically, we, got, we, we didn't have the men power. We were supposed to have six to eight guys on the gun. We had four. So you did multiple tasks. I learned a lot from doing more just being a sergeant. I actually was on the gun um, and, and doing not only controlling the gun, but actually firing it and everything. And that taught me a lot. You know, you ever heard the word duct tape? Uh, we put stuff together a lot with duct tape. We, what you call, adapt overcome or having to surprise and overcome use that a lot that's what we call duct tape um they're going to duct tape it today uh so uh but going on back to the embassy duty uh i had to go through the process and when i actually got picked you go through quantico virginia uh train up there where the fbi is and i was training during the 444 days of the uh the embassy being taken over and uh, Iran. And so they, they changed a lot of ways we did things. Uh, we actually, were, after that, we controlled the embassy. It was ours, uh, especially if we were getting attacked. You didn't come in or go out without us knowing about it. And uh, I had, um, we'll get back, I, I had to go through a board and I told you I had to see a, a, a general for the first time I've ever actually talked to one face to face. And then they, then you're allowed to stay. You think, you know, I got selected. No, you had to graduate. And then uh, I'll never forget, uh, we got to pick where we wanted to go and you had three choices. And I wanted to go to a, a hard one, uh, uh, not hostile, but a, a, a hard, hard uh, station. So I picked Bulgaria and I think I did Australia and somewhere else, I don't remember, but I, they asked, they made me stand up and said, you're going to, uh, remember her name is Sophia Loren, remember her? And that's what they said, and I knew I was going to Sophia. And it was a communist bloc country, so I had to, I had to have a little bit of extra training afterwards uh, for security reasons uh, because of communist country. And we were only six of us there counting the staff NCO, and we lived on, uh, and lived in the embassy in Bulgaria. And you talk about a culture shock. Oof, that was big time. Because when we landed at the airport, they took, they held my gear. They already knew it. This Marine comes up to me in, in a suit and uh, said, uh, fill this card out. I couldn't even read it. They wouldn't, back then, it even have like name. It was all in Russian. And they didn't, they were scared of us too, in a way. But uh, uh, so my first duty station or second duty station was Sofia, Bulgaria, American Embassy. And I was there from, 1980 to 81-ish because it was only a 12-month tour there because of the, the duty they wanted you. Uh, and I think I told you I had to have my motors, uh, I mean, wisdom teeth pulled. I had to have an extensive uh, uh, doctor check, you know, uh, physical to make sure because if you were sick, uh, you were probably going to be flown to Munich because they would not let you go to a doctor there. So... That's the first time. 
And so, if you have any questions about that, you can. Jeff, when so when you guys got selected for special things like that, or um, going back to like some of the traditions or like the history, um, and and this kind of ties in with I know when you guys make uh, uh, NCO and you earn your blood stripe, right? When you get selected for special duty, like, hey, um, you know, the embassy type stuff or like that, is there any kind of traditions or hazing that go along with any of that stuff? I can't say, no. <laughs> well, it, it ain't like it was a college or something. It wasn't extensive, you might consider it to be, but yeah, we, uh, I, I don't really remember, because uh, so many, when we graduated, so many, and we were so busy in groups uh, training. I mean, it was 24 seven. They would wake you up at 3 a.m. for a grill. It was just like if you were on embassy. In fact, it was a fake embassy uh, at Quantico. Uh, but as far as the, as the security, Marine security guard, I can't remember if we actually had any of that because it was more, you'd already been in the Marine Corps a while. It was sergeants, staff sergeants. There was all ranks in the school. Um, and you were monitored. I mean, you talk about drill instructors, but they wouldn't like they wasn't like drill instructors, but they were teaching you. They wanted to make sure you you knew your job or knew it well. Uh, out of 200 and something in a class, I think only 100 or 75 of us maybe uh, graduated. And, it's, and it could have been all kinds of issues, physical. You could do your background, could have come back. Um, and especially mine, I had to have like, a little kind of above the top secret. Uh, so uh, anyways, uh, but I can tell you a story and I don't know if, if uh, Rebecca knows about the blood scrub. Uh, I don't think they might've done it to the, to the ladies, uh, Marines, uh, women Marine. It could, it could, I'm not saying they didn't. Everything I don't even know. The same. Yeah, but uh, I, I uh, since I was in Bulgaria, it was hard to, I was a Lance Corporal when I got there. So it was hard to uh, get your stuff sewn on. I had to send it off. So I got corporal. Uh, and luckily, I was able to put that on there myself and someone. But I had to send because I had two dress blues. So one of them, I kind of knew it was going to get it. So I already had it there. But, but the, it was difficult to get, the, you know, to do the blood strike because it's got to be on there differently. Um, you got to go over the pocket. Remember, it's harder to sew that. Well, anyway, so I was walking in this and they asked us what that meant. And a lot of people don't know it's the bloodshed uh, through combat and our, our uh, not us combat individually, but through our wars, it's the bloodshed for those lost. Uh, and that's what that stands for. In fact, I don't know if you know this, but all of our uniform is tradition made from our other, you know, the army, kind of our dress clothes are made. But if you go back in the history in the 1700s, you'll look, the uniforms are pretty close to the same color. Yeah, they are. They are pretty uh, The blue is the, because mm -hmm. we're air, land, and sea. Uh, and uh, we're part of the Navy, of course. And, uh, but uh, I was walking around, they asked why uh, I don't have the red stripe on my pants, the Bulgarians did. And I was jokingly, and I said, well, you have to kill somebody to get them. And it was joke. I didn't say it kind of like that, but I said, you have to do combat or, uh, to get that. And they looked at, they were already scared of us. And about a month later, I had the blood stripes on. Oh. <laughs> so you can kind of see the looks like. <laughs> yeah. And so they were like, looking around, who's missing? <laughs> was that your last duty station or when you, where was your last duty station? And did you stay at that location? Like, were you in Texas at any, um, any duty stations here, even if you were attached to another service? And then did you stay in that area or um, did you eventually just kind of come back home? What happened when you, you know, was the last duty station that you had? Well, I went from Bulgaria to Austria. Austria, I came back to home, you know, leave. And then I went to Okinawa, Japan, and uh, Korea, Guam, Alaska, Alaska, Hawaii. I traveled on board ship for eight months, uh, attached to a unit. And uh, then I came back. Um, to answer your question, really, I was never stationed in Texas. 
the only place I was stationed in the state side besides a base was uh, recruiting duty in Columbia, Missouri. But never here until I got out. So, okay. So this kind of triggers me. What, what was it? You were enjoying yourself. You were having fun, you know, throughout serving your country through the Marine Corps and stuff. What was it that, that triggered going, this is it. I'm going to have to separate from service at this point. Mainly an injury, probably. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> I was on a, a gun, uh, on a howitzer, and uh, the trail wasn't set really good. And uh, it caused, the, when, it, when I fired it, or when we fired it, a, a portion, something got me in my leg. Yeah, because I, I just saw some safety, something safety wasn't right, and I jumped. Uh, and but luckily, he'd already moved, but it got me, and it didn't. I didn't think it hurt me as bad as it did, but um, so I continued. But I, you know how it is, suck it up. Uh, I just didn't think I, uh, any. I didn't think I was injured that much, but I, I eventually messed my knee up. Uh, I got it, I rehabbed it quite a bit. Uh, I was able to do my job. Um, and then, uh, so I thought, I was going to re-enlist. I'd like to be a, an MP. Even though my rank was a sergeant, it was going to be difficult. And I went to headquarters, it was proved all the way to headquarters of Marine Corps. And then and we knew that Desert Storm was coming. Uh, we knew this. We were already bombing uh, fake places of, uh, in, in uh, 29 bombs. We, would, we went out there and trained from Pendleton, and we knew it was coming. And uh, so since having a combat MOS, I would have had to stay, so they denied it. And then they looked into my, my knee more, and they gave me a choice to get out on an honorable or a medical, honorable or a medical. And I chose to just take the honorable and got out. That was probably a mistake of mine. I should have took, you know, and if you have an injury, anybody is in there right now, uh, I can tell you to make sure if you've got to get out, get out under medical, because it doesn't mean that you're less of a person. You're still going to be an honorable and nobody else is going to know that you were medical, but you and the VA, because uh, that I could have got help way earlier uh, in my life. But my knee wasn't really that bad, but I did crack my kneecap and I've had to require five knee surgeries since then on my own uh, but uh, that's why i had to get out i had to get out uh, I think people are... that's Go really ahead. important to share especially for those who are currently in and watching our show definitely make sure to get everything documented and it is not something to frown upon because you were injured you serve you're serving you served your country and these injuries are valid and over time for those of us who have been out for a while know that those injuries eventually will catch up to your present day life because you age and with age your body just doesn't stay the same and so those injuries can be magnified and you do deserve to be taken care of and try to like for your example with the knee issue get rehabilitation go through physical therapy or whatever's necessary to try and get you back as close as you can before that injury happened there is nothing wrong with doing exactly what jeff just said i mean that is really important for us to mention that. And the other thing is for those of you who are veterans that are watching and have not made any claims to the VA for the injuries that you've sustained, there is nothing wrong with going and filing your claims and getting the assistance that you need to, um, to address the issues that you have now, whether they're physical or mental, either way, it's really important. And it's, there's, it doesn't take away from your character or your service time or anything else. It's just part of one of the things that we've had to deal with in having made the decision to serve our country 
and and did, there's nothing wrong with that. So I think that that was a really good point that you made, Joe. My my thing is the separation. Like he talked about, hey, okay, I'm I'm getting out. This is how. When you separated out, Jeff was. Did you have a support team? Did you have people that was literally, hey, you know what, we're going to help you transition out, et cetera? Um, I always like to hear those that have come before me because you guys that came before me, um, you, I don't want to say you laid the foundation um, on the transition part, but you definitely helped bring some attention and awareness up because when I left, they had something that used to be called TAPS or GPS or whatever the program was at the time. And it was three days of, hey, here's how to build a resume. And here's some people that can possibly interview you. And then it was basically, hey, you're done. You're on your own kind of, you know, dump on the street type thing. Uh, did you have anybody transitioning in and helping you when, when you uh, had to separate from service? Not really because of the situation. Um, they were, we were about to go to war. I mean, we were really close. I mean, within months of going to Desert Storm. And um, so I kind of knew in advance that I was going to get out at a certain time. Uh, and I had recruiters come out from uh, law enforcement. I'd actually tried to uh, I <clears throat> put my resume. Well, you don't really have a resume back then. It wasn't like it is today. You didn't, I don't even think they asked for your resume back then. They said, where'd you work last, basically, and what your background is. That's all I know, because uh, I didn't have one. It was my DD-214. That was my resume. I didn't, you know, I didn't work much before I went in. Uh, that would have helped me, really, because it was so many years ago. Uh, but there is a way to do that now. I don't know if y'all did this, but you can go through and get your records and turn it into a college or look up your uh, some of the stuff that you did in the military can get you college credits. I have 40. I wish I could have used what I, but since the uh, embassy did was top secret, I could not use any of those credits or they could, they wouldn't approve them. You know, any trainings you had, I'm talking about, especially if you're technical training, can get you college credits. Now it ain't gonna lead to uh, a, uh, a degree probably, but it could help you start out if you have nothing. And I learned that later on because they don't tell you a lot still. You got to ask questions. And uh, the military is just not going to say, here, you can do this. Because they, I, it's like embassy duty. They never, uh, somebody told me about it. And and they said, when I did the, they said, you can't do this. And I said, yes, I can. And I'm going to prove it. I'm going to do it. And you still had to meet the requirements. It's like with anything. I mean, but I think if you, when you got out, did you end up going into college then and using your GI Bill or did you start into work? A lot of us back then, I know, because we're pretty close to the same age, we college wasn't something that was really a priority. It was go to work, job, you'll get job skills, life skills, and that's what's going to sustain you. But um, how did that work for you after you got out? I mean, well, a bit, that's one of my biggest regrets was when I was in especially in 29 Palms, California, they had a little college on the base. I don't think they do anymore, but it was like, a, I mean, you could have gone at night and they paid you, I think, three to one or whatever, if it cost you anything at all. The GI Bill wasn't like it is today. or, or uh, But, uh, you know, I, I that was my regret because I could have probably got a degree or something. Uh, but I just, I was young and I just didn't... Um, we thought we were invincible. I thought I was going to probably stay in as a career. That uh, was my goal. And uh, so when I got out, if I was going to do anything, I was going to do law enforcement is because of my training um, and uh, certain in the fields uh, that I was in. I, I don't know if I told you, I, I, I have a pith helmet right there that I was an instructor. Uh, that's one thing I did the last year. I was in the Marine Corps because of my knee. I worked at uh, Edson Range in, uh, by Pendleton and taught recruits. Uh, rifle and sometimes the 45 pistol uh, in nine millimeter. Uh, so that that's what I kind of do today. Uh, I'm a firearms, uh, um, I consider myself a master in firearms because I, I also do it on film sets. But anyways, uh, getting back to that, when I got out, I just, I went, I went into basic law, I swear, 
I uh, joined the um, Collin County uh, Sheriff's Department as a detention officer. And that's where I kind of found out I really didn't want to be a, be a police officer. And it's not, is the physicalities of it. My leg was still kind of messed up. Um, and uh, I'll say, I'm going to say it was the politics of the Sheriff's Department. And they're a little, I don't know, maybe I just was ready to get out. You know, Marine Corps taught you a certain way. Ten hut left foot. I just wanted to kind of get out of that a little bit, and uh, but I stayed in the field of security um, basically most of my life. Uh, I did event staff. I was a private person, a private guard to uh, some of the football players for Dallas Cowboys. I've done some uh, actors where I was uh, I would guard them. I just you know, wouldn't say one Tanya Tucker. I did uh, Tori Aikman. Uh, Dorset, a couple of those, just a private security kind of thing. I did that for many years. I actually helped run a security company. But uh, as far as uh, if I would tell anybody, if you're in, get if they offer it, it's there. Take the courses. Uh, get you. You don't have to get a degree, but I think it just helps you learn a lot of things that you may not. You know, you're not going to get the. Uh, I mean, you can go to college. I know guys have gone to college afterwards. Uh, and uh, but also can help you become an officer if you want to do that. Uh, maybe in another yeah. branch. I have one a thing. I, one thing I definitely want to hit while you're on that subject, Jeff, real quick. Uh, one of the most overlooked uh, benefits <clears throat> benefits that's out there for Texas veterans. Just look into the Hazelwood Act. And I will leave it at that. You yeah. would be surprised on your kids having their college paid for, and you don't even know it. Um, I'm doing my master's right now uh, for engineering and technical management with Texas A&M. And my company's paying a, a pretty good portion of it. But then the Hazelwood Act comes through and pays the rest of it. So I'm one of the lucky few that's going to end up with four degrees, that's all been paid for by somebody else. Uh, oh, my son. Too. That's where I got my help. I, you know, I just went to Collin County just to, you know, at the, at the time, I just wanted to, uh, I, I think it was when I went there, it was more, I, I, I was a computer tech a little bit where I would, would call me in for uh, problems. And I learned that on there. I went up there and took courses and it was paid for. Uh, Texas, though veterans and a lot of people don't know about the land you can get help with land in texas to buy a home as a veteran i know a friend of mine went through it bought a home his first home ever uh, because he was a veteran so there's things out there we're probably if we have time i'll tell you some help for other things especially since we're on this subject uh, it's, it's called vrock veterans resource outreach center here in rowlett texas it's brand new it's probably been out maybe two years now they have a setup there for it's got resources. It's got computers in every room, like from the Marines, the Army, the Navy, the Coast Guard, and the Air Force. Of that. And it's got all these rooms set up for the branch that will help veterans with uh, anything. I mean, you, you when you go to the VA, they'll help you a certain term, uh, point. But if you got to prove that you've got a disability, then they'll help you a lot with that. I had help. Uh, to get my, I'm actually 40% disabled. And uh, it, you just can't go in there and go, hey, you know, they'll look up your records. It could take a long, long time, but they will help you not only with uh, that, but they'll also help you mentally if you have issues. They're helping, they were helping a guy this morning. There was a 78 year old veteran homeless and they were helping him get him help. And uh, there are resources out there, but and I think I talked to you about this morning. We're very prideful uh, in the military uh, and, and, and in law enforcement too, but we're very prideful to admit we have an issue. Do we have a problem? And the first person that you reach out to first is a veteran, a brother or a sister, and they will listen to you. And then once you're done talking, they will hopefully help you, guide you. If they don't know the answer, they'll find it for you. We have to help each other, period. There's nobody else who's really going to listen. They will, but they may, they don't understand. 
has to be. Now, you may have saw something, and you may have saw something in your career that we could both be in combat together and watch our brother or sister get killed, but we handle it differently by the way we were raised, by maybe what we've already saw. Uh, you could have blinked and you didn't see it, but your mindset might have been different and it could still get worse. I mean, you can hold it in so long and eventually it's gonna come out. It will get weaker in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, you'll use, leave, lose that military strength and mindset that could cause you to want to take your life. And all I can say before you get there, reach out to one of us. That's all I can, that's the biggest thing. Uh, yep. Yep. Listen Absolutely. To something we might've said here, Yeah. reach out to somebody and get your help. Whether it's mentally, physically, anything, you have a question about uh, your DD-214, uh, you know, like we've all done different things. Uh, reach out to somebody. And if we don't know it, we'll find you somebody that does. Uh, you know, there's a lot Absolutely. of you know, your yep. DD-14, you can get it redone. You can add things to it. You can uh, get your medical records. There's ways out there. This, this place will help you. And there's a lot of others probably like that outside of the VA. Now, I'm not saying do not go to the VA because it could be a life, uh, life saving situation for you and uh, to go there if you need to. But don't hesitate. Don't right. be yep. prideful. 100, 100%. I, I totally agree with you. You've mentioned some great stuff with resources out there. Uh, tremendous. You, we've talked about growing up, your time in the service, uh, a lot of this the stuff you've gone through in your life and what it's doing, you know, still the mission that you're on today. Um, the dude on the bridge, <laughs> Jeffrey Gray. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, what is Jeffrey Gray doing now? It today and present day, it, what is it that you're doing now? Well, uh, you know, I, we talked about this. I don't like to promote myself as much as, as what I, uh, who I am. But what I do is my main goal, it's my mission. It became my mission out of just the blue. Um, I, I think I talked, there was a time I weighed 407 pounds. I, uh, my body just, I just got that way. I can't tell you, I just got lazy. My leg, I've had uh, nine, nine surgeries on my leg. I've had my shoulder operated, my elbow, I've had four concussions, two broken noses, cracked ribs, uh, you name it, okay? Uh, I, had a, I had excuses excuses there's another thing don't let them get stop you excuses excuses okay and i just wanted to give up i was letting my life just go away uh i had an intervention and i don't mean by like a group of people around me telling me jeffrey you got to get together um uh, my cousin was dying and i was I, I had to use a walker to get around and uh I visited him every day I could. And he was basically blind, partially blind. He couldn't really see you. And he went ahead and talked in weeks. And I went to him, I, I had my head down and he goes, Jeffrey. And I stood up and he goes, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna say a cuss word here, but he said, you're a fat blanky blank. You ain't the Marine I knew. Do me a favor and do something about that. Get back into that Marine. That's all he said. And uh, it didn't it didn't happen just that quick. But my mom made when she, when she was getting sick, she made me a promise that I'd do something too. And uh, it took funds that I didn't have, but she gave me the funds and I had the sleep surgery. And I lost uh, a lot of weight. And in that when you I, I got my pride back. Uh, I wanted to do something and um, God intervened too. And uh, I just started walking uh, my neighborhood. Then I walked to a park. And then when I started running, walking the bridge, I needed some water with me. So I had a hydration pack. Then the hydration pack went into my backpack. In the backpack, I better start putting a little flag on my backpack. And for and one day, the flag fell on, on my house up there. I had it on a pole and it fell to the ground. And I said, uh, so I was going to, to walk. And I threw it in the truck. And I said, what the hell? Hit it on my shoulder. 
and I've been doing it ever since. So I had to have a purpose. My purpose was when I found out about the 22 military suicides a day, and it was just a conversation. I went, what? I never knew that, ever. Never heard it of a period. And I was appalled. I said, if I didn't hear it, who else doesn't know? The world doesn't know. And I started walking and it just started Facebook. That's how somebody found me or the word got around. There was a Marine walking the bridge and then I was approached by somebody sent a news station out there and there we go. And I said, it ain't about me. And you've probably heard me say this, it's not about me, it's about them. It's always about them. And, uh, and then it goes to my, my saying, I can, I will, because I must. Somebody's got to do it, and I can. Uh, I'm basically semi-retired or retired. I walk it. I just started walking every day, mainly for me, but now it's, it's above me. It's not just for my community, but it's for, you've heard me say this, it's for my brothers and sisters in arms, past and present, and to bring awareness to the military suicides a day. I say that every time on the bridge. When I do a, I do a live feed sometimes, and that's what I say, and that's what I mean, period. That, that, that's awesome, man. You know, Texas Veterans Outdoors, we're all about working with veterans who are looking to get better in their personal lives as well as their professional lives if they choose that route as well. And I'm just glad to have you, Jeff, on our side. Uh, being one of the veterans who's willing to, you know, sit down and, and mentor. Uh, and you're very humble and you're very open-minded enough too about, about me and a mentee as well on things that you're working with and things that you're going through. Um, when, one of the biggest things I've noticed in our veterans who transition out is some of them have that, that, that trouble adjusting to whatever their job is, kind of, the, whether it's a corporate life, whether it's entrepreneurship or et cetera. And do you, one of the things that I want to, I would like to hear from you, if you're willing to talk about it, is do you feel that maybe your the culture that you had in the Marine Corps, did it help? Or do you think it kind of hindered on what you were doing when you got out, you know, um, having to completely change your life. Some people transition pretty easily. Um, what what did you find? Yeah, it, it's a it's a culture shock for sure. Uh, you know, um, it's it goes to that word mindset again. It's it's a totally different mindset. Um, you know, I didn't have to worry about a room and board basically. You know, uh, you had to. You know, I got a little shock at that when I was a recruiter. You know, I had to have my own place and I paid my bills and I never had to do that. I mean, we didn't have bills really, except for, you know, I don't know back then I was paying for a truck and they took it out of my pay. Uh, so, you know, we had, you were, you had three meals a day. You, know, you had a doctor. Uh, oh, you remember this? I don't know if you know this, but when you made a doctor for me, then you had, you had to show up, right? Uh, do y'all oh, remember you that? you don't miss any of those things. No, you, there was another formation for you. And if you missed it, you were in trouble. Um, but anyways, yeah, I, it was a it was a culture shock. And luckily, in a way, that was I went right back into a tent hut, left foot kind of culture uh, when I worked at the sheriff's department. But you had to get to work. You had to, I didn't live on on my job. I didn't live there. You know, on the base. Uh, most of my time, I never lived off base. In fact, I didn't. Uh, I never did until I was a recruiter. But yes. Uh, there is a culture shock, but now there's help for that. You can reach out to people and do so, really do so, because, you know, especially these guys now are coming back for combat, and, you know, we've been in combat for 19 years, and uh, really more than more that, 20 if you consider dead or swarm. So, you know, there's resources out there that wasn't out there available to me uh, that you can go get help for getting you a job. Uh, I, you may know those more than me. But, uh, you know, pretty rocks one of them, but you, you, you're going to need somebody to build that resume for you that you don't have, but you could turn a lot of that you learned in the military into a piece of paper that were your civilians going like, uh, what's 0811? You know what I mean? 
Okay, in artillery, what did you learn, sir? What could it transition to a job? That means you don't qualify to work only on construction. I think you need, that's where, when you know you're gonna get out while you're in to find something in the military. Now, I know you might be an aircraft mechanic, but is there something else that you can start learning on your own for a trade to transition that trade into, and I've been talking to about my nephew. My nephew's in the Marine Corps, by the way, and he does work on planes. Uh, and he's probably, and he went, he was re reserved now he's active and he's probably going to make a career. Now, even if you do make a career, are you going to come out? Are you going to, th you're going to think you have to do law enforcement or security? No, you can still train as a nurse or doctor. You can do any of that and, uh, but prepare for it, get prepared, have a, have a plan when you, before you get out, don't just walk at that door. And if you have to do that, find resources are you going to be you don't want you, know, you might be working at mcdonald's and you don't need to do that you can find a job and they can use you for your mindset and your core values your values you know you're going to show up and rebecca probably know there's an actor they love to hire military because we show up you know my you know, the thing i say get up dress up and show up every day that's that phrase right there is so important on so many different levels mm -hmm. because it really puts a good mindset to achieving so many different things and i want to talk to you just for a minute about that because you've had such really valuable history and you have so much wisdom now from all the things that you've learned from your childhood, from your service time, what you've done since you have been out. And when you combine all of that and you are such an example and such an inspiration to so many, tell me what you're doing now and where it's leading you, what you'd like to, we always have to have goals and um, reach for the stars. That's how we grow. What have you got going now, Jeff? Well, I mean, you have to, you know, it's like I do the acting thing. And if you're going to do something, do it 110%. Okay. Don't half-ass it, as I can say. Um, if you're going to do anything, whatever, and get up every day. Uh, make that task. Find that little task to do every day. Something small. Plan in advance. Have a calendar. Have uh, a purpose. We talked about that. I have a purpose every day, and that's the bridge and what I do at the bridge. Not just my walk, uh, but I do it to bring attention, and that is my mission. But I have some things I do for myself. Find something for yourself, too. Don't, uh, you know, have a hobby, something small. I don't care. Uh, do something uh, outside of to make you happy. You still have to be happy in this life. Um, you know, and that's one thing I think we, we get away from is being happy, uh, smile. You know, that's one thing I've changed a lot. I think I told him I had to change a lot of my friends, a lot of the way I live my life. I don't drink. I haven't drank in over 20 years. Uh, it's his decision I made. I think I was letting that lead me a little bit in the wrong ways. Um, I'm not saying you have to be religious, but being uh, have a purpose, have a belief uh, in not only yourself, but others. And the biggest thing I can say too is make a difference every day. Do something outside, whether you go to a grocery store and you see that somebody trying to reach for something they can't offer, don't know, you just reach for it. Offer, may I help you? Uh, always ask, you know, uh, but find something, pick it up, trash. You see something, don't just walk by it, just make a difference. If it's small, just do something out. Make somebody smile, say, how you doing? Thank you, you know. Uh, I tried to do that with, especially during the pandemic, when the grocery store, I'd always say thank y'all for what you're doing, especially your nurses and your doctors and them guys, truck drivers, you know, say a, the word thank you, uh, appreciate you. Uh, you know, we hear it, don't you, don't we? Thank you for your service. You know what I say? Thank you. Okay. Because they're going out of their way to thank you for that. I, you know, we just don't, I just, I have to say something. It, it was, you know, what do y'all say? It's, it's, uh, you can hear that all the time. 
And yeah, yeah. For, for me, I know it's, you know, just, just wearing this shirt alone, you know, the, the one I got on today, one of the many shirts I got for Texas Veterans Outdoors. I, these things for me have been such a, a welcoming uh, conversational point. I've had people come up to me just because they see the shirt. Hey, thank you for your service and so forth. So what I say is, you know what? Thank you for the acknowledgement. That is so much appreciated. Just being acknowledged and, and being respected by you enough to where you can come up to me and say that. That, that right there alone speaks volumes, at least for me. Because this new generation was not taught about the importance of veterans. They weren't taught about the, the true role that, that a veteran has in their life. You know, and, and these are the people that, that I'm talking about right now, not only you know, the, the teenage kids, but also some of these younger folks that are in that 20 to 25 range right now, age range, they have no clue at least the majority of them that I've dealt with have no clue I mean, you why know, first, veterans are even important. Well, when I first got out, I got in uh, 90. And so I, I didn't have a sticker on my truck. Uh, I didn't wear a cap because uh, they wouldn't, you couldn't buy them like you can today. I didn't have a t-shirt. I didn't have nothing. So I didn't uh, say I was a Marine, except for the people in my group that knew me. Uh, and it wasn't that I wasn't proud of it. It just wouldn't. Uh, and then when we came combat, when we went to war, I did it mainly for them. I wanted to show that I supported my veterans and I was a veteran and I support them and what they're doing uh, always. And uh, it just, you know, now we can buy the shirts it, almost anywhere, a cap uh, or whatever that says a veteran. And uh, so that's why I do it in our, it's changed now uh, you just didn't say that back then uh, very much. And I, I, I want the better at the Vietnam veterans that are also the worst forgotten. And that's where a lot of the suicides are coming from right now is actually was World War II and Korea and uh, Vietnam. And now we're starting to see it in our uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, Iran, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, all the wars were in, even the skirmishes that we've gone through in other countries uh that combat the experience is is and when they get out it's going to be difficult you were talking about transition there is the biggest transition is uh that that uh p what we call is a not ptsd anymore it's ptsi uh post-traumatic stress incident you can get those almost if you see your mom die, if you see somebody die in a car accident, you're going through almost one of those a day, really. And something can trigger you that you see on television. And I can go back and, and about, I don't know if y'all follow me on Facebook, I don't know as much. I had an incident in uh, October. Or uh, when did the, when did the, what's his, not October, when did the basketball player pass away, uh, Kobe? Well, y'all remember when that was? Well, anyways, uh, I, I thought it was short January time frame. Maybe I, I yeah, me well, and time frames or no, <laughs> me and time well, frames. I had an incident in, in, in the Marine Corps. I was in Korea and a, a helicopter went down and killed all the, all the guys on, on, on it and hit a mountain. And we had to go back out there on a helicopter to pick them up. And uh, we kind of, we just didn't bother to make that. We just went and I uh, knew some of them. And to see, I'm not going to get in detail, but to see what I saw and the smell and everything, to know that you have seen some of the guys, that uh, was pretty rough. And we had to go do some, we did some counseling and um, just kind of stuck with the other, some of us and let me eternally and then talk about it. And then I saw another one while well, the next day, then another buddy man was killed. A CH-53 was taken off at, uh, in uh, Lejeune and it, and it, uh, it was pretty new and it was picking up a Howard and it blew up uh, and killed all of them. So helicopter or that, but when Kobe died, uh, they showed a clip. It wasn't his and it triggered me. I saw this helicopter go down and to see that 
uh, it, talking about it now don't bother me. For some reason, it just triggered the crap out of me. Um, and I had this, I could not stop this feeling. Uh, I mean, I've had them before, but I could not, my, my mind was kind of, I was thinking, what's going on? Why are you doing this? What's, and my body was reacting differently, y'all. It was just shaking. Uh, my wife tried to hug me and uh, I could, no, I couldn't. So we, I can't, I can't handle this. I couldn't, I didn't, the suicide part didn't come up, but I just was freaking out. And they, I went to the ER and this is the pandemic, the pandemic was going on y'all. And uh, they were suited up and everything. I was sitting there going like, oh, what is going on? And the doctor, before the doctor, the nurse came in, she's calming me down. And she goes, uh, she goes, stand up. You know what she did? She, and during all that, she hugged me and I hugged her back. And the doctor came in and he didn't say nothing. Uh, it gave me uh, something to calm me down, but that calmed me down. Uh, just, the, just the touch. Remember, we couldn't touch nobody. Uh, you know, the, the hug, the greeting, but she was going through the same thing I was. She was seeing stuff she'd never seen before. Uh, people dying of the, of the virus. And uh, she helped me. I think we helped each other that day. And I learned a lot just from that. And I never had one since. Uh, I don't know what happened, what triggered, that triggered me, but I can watch it again and I won't get the same, it won't happen. Uh, but that happened. So if you get triggered, uh, you know, and I and I actually had to do this with somebody. I'm not going to say why, but he was triggered. And uh, this is before I knew. You uh, you get their attention. You make them smell something. Uh, make them touch something around you. I mean, in this sense, I made him touch a tree. I made him laugh. Uh, get him out of that area, their zone they're in. Because uh, you will maybe, if they're, if they're not blinking, they got a problem, get them help. Uh, but if you're feeling that way, do those things, look up anxiety attack, panic attack, touch something, smell something, uh, look at something, make you laugh, just get, you know, ground, the word grounding, you got to be grounded quickly. Uh, or reach out and call somebody and tell them that you're having an issue. Do not hesitate to admit you're having a problem. Uh, and because I tried to fight it, I was sitting there going, what is going on? You know, I, ain't, I, I never felt that way. It's like somebody pulled cold water and hot water on me at the same time. I don't know if you've ever, both of y'all have ever experienced that before, but if you do, that's what you do and it will help you. Breathe, 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 relax, calm yourself down because you can calm yourself down. And if you can't, go get help, call somebody. Don't, don't get in, that's where the weapons are, you know, I have weapons here. They don't. They don't do anything unless I make do make them do something. That and you saw me in that film. Don't get there. A dog saved, and that was a true story. It was actually a cat. In this film I did, I can. I will. I must. I'm bringing this up because, in the film, I was about to kill myself uh, from something I dealt. With, the character dealt with, and uh, I had a gun to my head, not to pull the trigger. And the dog barked, got my attention, and that dog saved my life. Later on in the film, I'm walking with my dog. I meet a guy that I met in combat, and he was about to take his life. I saw his look, and I stopped him, which the dog really did too because he was with me. But I saved him. And in the film, I showed 22 people. They all had a number, 22 people. So you could actually see what 22 faces a day look like 22 kill themselves a day in the military and if you see all three of us with one of them then it puts a face to that number and it's very very uh <clears throat> it was very uh, moving to see that and i had i had a thought and i think you uh, <sighs> It's it's very difficult to even think about that uh, for me, and because we're it's we're not, it's not doing enough. We got this show. If you, we can say, you know, I said that's one for one, mine for them. If whatever I can do, whatever I say, save one of this show, it's worth every effort you guys do. 
Uh, and I want to thank y'all for doing this show because it needs to be done. Well, th well, thank you. You know, that just just thank you for that again that that acknowledgement. But you know, thank you for being a community leader, somebody who stepped up in their community. And you you didn't do this here recently. I mean, you've done this six something years ago when when you started walking that bridge and you've been doing it all this all this time day in and day out regardless of the weather you go out there bundled up strapped up ready to go and you do this and you're doing it for you and you're doing it for every single person out there trying to change their lives you know thank you it, jeff in my eyes that's that success right there it, it's service to somebody else that you don't even know, but you are making a successful impact, not only in your local community, but obviously if you've got news crews and people showing up and you're all over social media, you're you're reaching way more than just Rowlett Rockwell, or Rockwell, excuse me. You're you're way out there on, on a global platform. You know, you're in the film that you just mentioned earlier. Um, that's on Amazon Prime, global. Anyone can pull that off. And what I like about that is even our troops that are overseas serving, they can pull that up while they're over there, watch, and actually be able to touch base with somebody that's back home here. But on the just the subject alone, it makes them aware. And they if they can take what you're doing and spread it and help somebody over there, that's amazing, man. Amazing. But, Thank you October, for coming on today. Well, I told Rebecca, I'm not alone. <laughs> and you guys are doing the same thing. You're carrying that flag. Thank y'all for y'all, by the way. Um, Semper Fi Marine down on the bottom there. And thank Semper you for your ride. Thank Semper you for the ride. The Navy guy, I always say thank you for the ride. <laughs> thank you so much for everything that you're doing and for taking some time out today. And by the way, you two were in the film. Uh, I've got your six. And That's we're going to give a plug, right? Uh, Bill Foster made this film with all veteran cast. And he was very adamant about that. Uh, I was seeing the different, this this way and back of my head. Because everybody, even the extras, had to be a veteran. And it's going to be coming out. I don't know his platform yet. Uh, probably Amazon Prime. But it's been in, won a lot of awards. And we're about to go to a the premiere on the 16th. And I haven't seen it. Rebecca hasn't seen it. And you have, though, you lucky guy. But that's okay. Yeah. Um, I'm glad I waited. I really wanted to wait until the premiere to see this. Uh, but uh, hopefully when it does come out, they'll plug it again. And you should watch this. It's about us. Oh, by the way, there it is right there. Can y'all see that? I don't know if it's this way or whatever. It says, I've got your six with this little semicolon means your story is not over. God hasn't finished your, your paragraph, sentence, or your story. So stick around for it. He's got more for you. And then this one, never quit. I did, that was the first tattoo I've ever had. And it, and it helps me never, ever quit. Because what? So my other leg, I can, I will. Because I must. Temper Amazing. 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 Thank you, Jeff. Uh, definitely appreciate it. And I, I can't, I can't say, it just words can't describe uh, how glad I am to bring you on board with Texas Veterans Outdoors and, and being a, a voice in your community. I mean, that, that's, that's amazing. You, you've done already quite a lot, and I'm here to support you. The staff of Texas Veterans Outdoors is, is here to support you any way that we can uh, on, the, on future stuff that's going on. Uh, Rebecca uh, came on board this year as a community leader down in the Belton area, so she's taken up stake in our central region down there, and I just can't, can't ask enough of those veterans out there and even people who are supportive of veterans. If you want to get involved making a difference, 
come on board with us. That's what we're here for. We're here to help people grow personally, and we're here to help them grow professionally if they would like to. So thank you, everybody. And Jeff, I would like for you to close it out, um, being our guest here with give us some of the people who really that you see making a difference that outside of our organization. I know you discussed earlier this morning with me on a pre-call, you know, the 99% or the, the mad radio, um, feel free, use this time frame, open that up. Let's let, let's let others know, you know, Texas veterans outdoors, just because you're not part of our organization doesn't mean that we're not going to collaborate with you. Doesn't mean that, Hey, uh, we're not going to support you. Now, if you're a veteran in Texas and you're doing something positive, man, you, you've got a, you've got a home with us. I want to mention, uh, these two guys approached me and, uh, it became its own little, uh, organization or nonprofit. Uh, it's called hashtag walk the bridge. And, uh, I started walking, you mentioned this or now, but when they would do this on the 22nd every month, uh, sometimes I, I don't show up because I didn't want it to be the leader. It's not me. Okay. It's them, the group. I go when I can, because they do it at a certain time. So always, I'm not available on the 22nd, but they do, they're getting bigger. That, that group, John, uh, John Slurno and Brian Wilburn, uh, put, this that they named they within a year they uh, got the right people you have i believe you always have to be in the right place at the right time and you need more people sometimes to help you get there and it just worked out that they called it heroes memorial bridge between rockwall and Rowlett, texas on highway 66 uh but that uh so they run two radio sh uh, shows on facebook platform uh, one of them's called the 99 percent uh network and they're uh, Leos and former military uh, that have a motorcycle club. And so if you're into that, if they have great topics about everything from suicide and that's uh, to, every, I mean, everything. They, will, they have people on the show. Uh, and I would like for them maybe one day to have you on your show. I'll try to see if I could talk to them about that, especially on the Mad Radio and talk about your organization, uh, get it out there. Uh, so I told him I was going to talk to them about that. And the other one's MAD, M-A-D, uh, and it's called Make a Difference. And I've been on that show, and that's what they talk about, people that are making a difference in their community, and, the, and it's gone uh, worldwide followers. Uh, he goes, uh, John Sonoma really does it, and a lady named Sam, uh, Samantha Horowitz, she was actually, John and Samantha were at 9-11. Uh, Samantha was in the Buena the Towers and uh, got out of there. She was actually a Secret Service agent. And John is a uh, fireman and a police officer uh, during that day. And they both have problems. Sam's got a, uh, she's a, I don't, know, I don't know if it fits in the veterans, but Sam, uh, Samantha, she's got a book out about that. And uh, I would plug about her. Um, I know that's, it's, I'm just saying that she was there and they're helping, they're making a difference. So I'll check into their radio station, especially veterans who may have questions, you could call them. Uh, they've actually, that show has actually saved somebody uh, from committing suicide. And uh, that's what this is all about, is to get help uh, to veterans in need. And they may actually have somebody that they know that's watching this, that has that veteran, and maybe they want to talk to you, but they'll talk to one of us or a veteran. And that's why I want to say again, reach out to your brothers and sisters. Absolutely. So Jeff, thanks for being here, buddy. And if any of you watching the show today have resources, uh, throw it right there in the comments. Uh, that this this show is straight up intended to highlight somebody who's been successful in their life, share their story in hopes that we can inspire and help one, at least one veteran. And the only way that, that this can even be successful is for everybody to be involved. 
um, that's those watching, that's those partaking in the show, whether you're behind the scenes on the production crew, whether you're, you know, in front of the camera, such as Jeff is today, it's going to take all of us to actually make a difference and be a part of this being success once again. Um, there's so many resources out there that we don't know. There's so many organizations out there that are actually doing something good that we don't hear about. So please feel free to drop something in the comments, share this with other veterans, and let's really, really spread this and, and help make an impact. So thanks everybody for watching. And Rebecca, I'm gonna kick it over to you. I'm good today. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. I wanna thank everybody that has tuned in for taking time out of their day to listen to Jeff's story and share in all of the insight that he has. Hopefully that this will make an impact on you and you will share this with your friends, your family, everybody that you know. And I wanna thank you, Jeff, for being here today and everything that you're doing. You're quite an inspiration and definitely someone to emulate. So thank you very much. Thank you all for having me. I enjoyed it very much to get our, get our word out there. Sisters, only they.